me hit the record button. I am recording oh, now. Oh, well, then let me hit my share screen mm -hmm. of my PowerPoint presentation here before you hit record, because that's one of the tips that I want to share. But you should be seeing my, my summing it up screen. Yep, we're good. And, and so basically, if you saw my video, which I tried to make a short version of it and a long version of it, but I basically talked about how this last semester I had to kick it into high gear and use flipped learning, which I had learned a few years back, but had never needed to use it. And, um, and with the situation, the coronavirus, well, then I, I decided to just start flipping my class at week four, and I did the rest of the 16 weeks flipped. And so this was my short, quick, dirty rendition of how to do flipped learning in a science and engineering class where you use a lot of whiteboard time to do problems, to learn how to do the problem. So that's basically where I was coming from. Uh, and so as I did prepared for this presentation, I talked about four quick steps to make flipped learning happen. Uh, I guess I'd like to ask in the chat and i got to get my chat back going here. I have to put the chat over on the other screen so that I can see what people are saying. Um, but I'll watch the chat. You can if you want, but I'll make sure I watch it. we got a lot of people coming in. So this okay. is, this so, is good. So kind of my first question I'd like to throw out there is, um, did you watch the video? So you can just say yes or no or thumbs up. And if you didn't, that's perfectly fine. And that's what I tell my students. Um, because I expect them to learn over time that it's in their best interest to watch the video before coming. Uh, and so these are the four steps that I kind of ran through to do my quick and dirty uh, flip learning in my class. My assumption coming into this is that you, like me, have your set of PowerPoint presentations for your course, 15, 16, 20 PowerPoint presentations that you've been using for several years. That was my assumption. So having a PowerPoint slide presentation, how do I get that flipped and into a way that I can make my classes work? This semester, I had Wednesday three-hour classes. So I was sitting on an entire week that the students would have to be doing something and then come back to class. So on Wednesday afternoon, I took my PowerPoint presentation for the next week and I screencasted that PowerPoint presentation. That's step one. Got it recorded and uploaded it. Step two, right on Wednesday after I've had class with the students, I send them a new link and I say, next week's class is posted and it's your assignment in the next six days to watch that video and be prepared for class. Mm -hmm. So then coming into class, step three is quiz and discuss that video. And here I admit I'm very lacking in good quiz techniques and good ways to get my students discussing the video. Um, so I'm open to suggestions there, but make sure that they've asked, that they've seen the video. And in my case, it was just ask them. And I was amazed. They were, you know, and I said, honestly answer, did you watch the video? And then I'd ask one or two questions, and it really seemed like the vast majority had watched the video. Now, this is engineering class, so these students are coming in wanting to, typically wanting to learn. Yeah. Um, and so then step four during my class session is now to do the homework that I used to typically leave them to do on their own and do in little groups and try to figure out we would work the homework together in a whiteboard app um, and from that then leave them one or two more problems to do on their own and then right after class i was recording the next session powerpoint presentation getting it screencast getting it posted and back so um do we have anybody answering the question did you watch the video and then we can go to these four so steps. So most of them know are the ones that answered. Okay. Um, Joy said she did a she did a quick browse through it. Um, okay. Mawathi, uh, sorry if I mispronounce your names. I'm good with Hispanic names and Canadian. Um, 
Anglo names. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, but she said yes, or he. I'm not sure actually, so I, I shouldn't have said. Great. All right. So, did, did you want to um, share what any thoughts or? Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Uma as in Uma Thurman. Now I got a picture. Awesome. Uh, did you have some questions for Joel directly about that? What you what you saw in the video? And thank you for watching it. I know. Yeah. Thank you for watching it. Joel and I were working with together to make sure he was ready for it. Feel free to jump in with questions either in the chat. Joy, you got your hand up. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, I was wondering if there is anything you thought was more specific to uh, flipping engineering as opposed to another subject, or especially question. like, you know, design. Mm -hmm. Because I, I do have somebody at my school who's like, how on earth am I going to do like de tech design online next year? I'm like, okay, well, maybe I can pick up some tips for you tonight. Yeah, so uh, in my video, the one thing I said was like the most expensive part of my setup is my pen pad, right? So I did go out and get a pen pad. Actually, I stole it from my son, who is an <laughs> artist, and I said, I need your pen pad. And so with the nice. pen pad uh, that I, I'm sure you're familiar with, or I hope you're familiar with, but so the pen pad or tablet, then I can make comments right on my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and I'll also be making comments using the the um, the shared whiteboard on online. Okay. And so having the pen pad makes it a whole lot easier when you're doing engineering problems to actually write. And I'm still having trouble getting my hand to be a good hand and coordinated on this pen pad, but I'm doing better. Right. I teach drawing and design also so i have to be able to do that type of sketching and you know with the mouse it's just not going to work no the mouse is impossible i, I bought one recently so, and my kids kind of sequestered it because they thought oh this is a cool new toy i'm going to learn how to use it for art and stuff yeah yeah so uh, the the typical um uh company that people buy is the wacom that's like or wacom or something that's what yeah. it's called uh, then the other thing that's not so much needed for the engineering, but I'll tell you one tip about it is the green screen, right? So I'm using this green screen that allows me to change that background. And if I can get back to the video settings, yep. I'm trying to get back to my video settings. Do you, I, I mean, I, I joked that the engineering oh. students were um, square and someone picked that up. And so do you think your students are more likely to be watching the videos because you know they're engineering students or you mentioned that they might be more dedicated because I, I think it's true at least in our culture of our school that our engineering students tend to be more dedicated students and not just going to school because they're just going to school yeah yeah and especially at our university i say that that happens because um Many, many of our students in the engineering programs have scholarships, academic yep, scholarships. Yep. They're coming from middle income families that are making a huge sacrifice to get their kid into the best university in Mexico. And yep. that's for third, third, fourth, fifth best university in Mexico. And so these students know that this is a, they're privileged to have this opportunity. And yes. so they're here, they want to learn. And, and they're pushing the boundaries with the professor all the time to get what they want, what they feel they need. It. So it, it's a different setup in that regard. Yeah. I agree. We have that cultural um, situation with our students for sure. Yeah. Uh, I just changed the background on my, on my, uh, on my zoom so that, okay, now we're in a engineering or in a, in a, in a shop and we're preparing to make, make something. So I do a lot. I every session I have a different background that I can kind of get the feel that we're in the right place. So that's the green screen. Cool. And then the other uh, tool that I use that I've used is let me go back to share my screen. And this time I'm going to share just the screen. Yep. Um, to get over here and is to do the the aww app online whiteboard i got to use it for three months for free i didn't know that it was gonna 
want to charge me. And today when I opened it up after having not used it for two weeks, it said, oh, you have to get the pro, you, we, you've lost your account. Right. And so I was really bummed that, about that because it is a good one. I'm going to copy the link into, or maybe you can do it, Kent. No, I probably no, I can't. Let me go back over here to Zoom. I got to get the chat. Yeah, you lost your chat window. If you left it there, I could type it quickly. Here it is. And but these are the participants. Where's the chat? N R I E A E V A Y A M. If it ends in the M, we're good. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, shoot. Well, we got to stop the share then. And yeah, I think I can see it. It's an unnamed whiteboard. Okay, so you, you get into an unnamed whiteboard with me there. And so now we're sharing this whiteboard that I can write on. And if you join, you can write on. Oops, yep. Now I need to share my screen. I got the right link. Uh, so I can make my sketches. But what I really liked about this one is that um, I, I've got my PowerPoint presentation open that I would normally be using in class. I can take from the PowerPoint presentation and place the image. I just do a simple copy paste from my PowerPoint presentation uh, so that I can prepare the, whatever assignment we're going to work together. Here I'm pasting the what uh, text. There's the problem statement from my PowerPoint presentation. Right. So real quickly, I don't have to rewrite the whole problem statement. I can just say, hey, guys, here's the problem statement, and then grab my pen pad uh, and start writing the whatever the math part of the problem is. And right. so on that whiteboard, what I really liked about this, it's even better than working in class, is the student will now make a comment right here and say, hey, professor, what does that mean? you know, right on the whiteboard. Whereas in class, he would have had to pointed or gotten up out of his seat, gone up to the whiteboard and circled what he had a question about. So really in that sense, this works better. And then of course I say, I can save this, make it available. And I'm recording this session so that the students have a recorded video copy of the homework in case they want to go back. And what the students love to do is to find where I make mistakes and remind me a day or two later, hey, prof, I found that you made a mistake in this part of the problem statement. What do we do? So it just tells me that, okay, they really are paying attention. They really are using these videos. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have found that out. Cool. And so does the export of the board, does it, is it, does it create the video rendering in time or just like the final product? It, it makes a PDF. Okay. But I'm recording the Zoom session. Right. That's recording right. the AWP. So okay. I have the Zoom. So they see the process. Um, Good. One, one tip that I learned in one of the other sessions yesterday, the day before, somebody reminded me, you don't want to edit that Zoom video because that Zoom video is super highly compressed and it's yes. good quality. I, I've done that and it'll take you four times as long to upload it, yes. So when I start recording, I try to always make sure that I start my recording with the, uh, do I got the right one here? With the first slide of my PowerPoint presentation. Right, the title. That has the title and my name and everything. And then that's the thumbnail that shows up yeah. whenever you're showing, you know, passing the video. Yeah, you're 100% right, Joel, because I've shared my email accidentally because I forget I'm sharing. And then I go back and I edit that out. And then the video is like much, much, much bigger. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So get in the habit of start the share, share your screen, make sure you're on your, your PowerPoint presentation, and then hit the record over in the and the extras of the Zoom, if yeah. you're doing Zoom. Pro at doing videos. And so what else do you think is different? Because that was the question more, uh, what's different with engineers? I mean, 
we don't really teach non-engineers that much, although you might get some others. Yeah, you know, you have to have some sort of a whiteboard. And everything I'd done before when I didn't have the whiteboard, I was like, how, how can I, you know, do work problems with the students? So, but now I'm open to suggestions on, a, on an app that's free of the whiteboard. This AWWAPP looks like it's only free for a few months. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm blank in that. Um, I forgot an actual colleague is doing um, some. Go ahead. I, it was in the chat, but I've used BitPaper, B-I-T-P-A-P-E-R. Yeah. And well, also Zitboard, Z-I-T-E-B-O-A-R-D. And Numa put up Jamboard for Google Suite for Education. Thanks for that. I will remember, Joel, as well, to... Uh, uh, well, I'll get the export of the chat when I close right. the session. So, right, I'll make sure, right. and I can share that with you in case you want to do a, a wrap up session with links and stuff. That'd be great too. Mm -hmm. Loom Loom has whiteboards. Yeah, because I find I, I think that's really useful. I I don't see the need for that for myself, so I don't have a good um a good analogy. Computer science is very different, and software engineering and the programming I do is very different. How I do screen right. sharing. What are your, your screen sharing the, the code? The code. We're just like, show me your yeah. code. And I'll say Uma or I'll say Lori or whoever, show me what you're working on and we'll look at your working on and collaborate in it. And we'll all talk through it and collaborate on some collaborated. Or the breakout rooms where we'll, right. one of the students will be sharing and the other ones will be telling them what to do and backseat driving their code. Um, but, uh, how is yeah. how is your use of breakout rooms been going? I wasn't having to use breakout rooms because I had two groups of twelve students. Each. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay, it was supposed to be one group, and for some weird ad admin problem, they had to make two separate groups. So I was like, okay, that's fine. But uh, who was it that said that they teach physics? Was it was it Joy? Um, Andrea does. Joy and Andrea. Um, yeah. Joy said she teaches science. So either one of you, what else do you find is different of teaching sciences or engineering? Um. <laughs> well, we had a special case um, because our ministry mandated that we were only allowed to have a certain number of hours per week. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually in a full year school, so I only had an hour and a half like that we were allowed to give for anything like wow. work beginning to end for my course. Um, if, if it were a semester, then you could give them three hours. Uh, so that was, um, that was interesting. I found the, the labs, like I, because I still wanted to get them to do, I'm, I'm a very inquiry based type teacher and uh, getting them to do labs was very interesting. So I was, I was, I got to know Desmos, the activity builder coding a lot better than I had anticipated. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, it was, I, could, we could, I couldn't even try to do collaborative stuff because it was just, it was that we also had your marks up to March 13th for your marks and they couldn't go lower. And so some students just checked out. Yeah. So it was, it was not a, it was not a usual situation. So. Certainly, certainly. <laughs> I don't know though. It'd be cool if, if, uh, on all assignments, we would have we would be obliged to or obligated to put the expected time of, of completion on an assignment, uh, like they do in the tax forms in the states. This this or government forms. This should take you only an hour to do. It takes you yeah, I, I tried that. But it's out, having that idea. Yeah, it it turns out my times were off. <laughs> Yeah, and then do you this gear that towards your strongest student or your weakest or right what right yeah I, well, I was trying to sort of like like i'm like well this took me about 15 minutes to do so it should probably take you 30 to 45 minutes <laughs> but i yeah that time factor is really interesting to see on exams you know when when you give an exam and 30, 40, 50 percent of the students will finish it almost at exactly the same time. You wonder if it's the peer pressure that's getting them to finish or it's just the natural turn of events. When they ask a question about a problem on the exam, you know, and the person is at the end of the second page and you realize you have a mistake there and you go look around and everybody else is at the end of the second page. And you're like, 
okay, so it really is taking them about the same amount of time. And then you have the outliers that use up the entire time. Something else I find can be different about teaching science is the ability to show like demonstrations online. So um, if you look, think about like the explore flip apply method, there's the idea of like you pop up a demo and then you have the students try to figure out like what's going on in this situation, like can you explain it? So that can be useful too. Um, I put up videos sure. where I show like myself even just weighing something on one electronic balance versus another that has a, a different level of precision to talk about significant figures. So, you know, just bringing that kind of idea in that, why do we even worry about sig figs? Like, just, is it just a pain in the butt? No, it's got a reason for it, right? Um, but mm. even, when I do calculations, I, I used to have a, a Wacom tablet and I found that my tablet writing was not good. So I moved towards just doing like a document camera looking at me writing on paper and that's mm. that's what I find works for me. But for those who have a tablet, you know, it's fantastic because then you can be fully electronic. Um, and I put it in chat, I know some people use like an iPad and a stylus to, to do like explain everything and record that way too. But I like paper, that's just me. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, there are different different solutions and I've seen uh, people have actually connected the tablet to the Zoom call or to the whatever other uh, the meeting is and that way the tablet is one of the people that's in the room and then they can they can share that with themselves and have it being able to project that. So that's good. Uh, yeah, one of the things I mentioned in my video was, you know, what is your your hook for your class? Um, and hopefully you're adding to your video, your screencast, some hook video to get them engaged into the topic. My hook video was, if anybody saw it, was about Mexican tortilla machines and how there are hundreds of thousands of tortilla machines all over Mexico that are producing the tortillas that we eat every day. And what do we need to do to make these machines more efficient and so on. So that was my intro to for that particular topic of the class. But yeah, looking for videos to, to make as the hook at the beginning is very important. Yeah, I shared one thing. I, I finally remember what it was, Joel. It's, it's called limnu.com. I actually know the founder. I'm not sure what the status is for free use, but I'll, I'll share that with you later if you don't get it from the chat. Okay. Uh, but I know the founder from my contact with SIGGRAPH. And so uh, it, I know it's pretty cool. And that I'm was sure. the, for a whiteboard. Yep. Yep. Whiteboard. Okay. It, it says it's the online whiteboard you've been looking for. So, yeah. Okay. I played around with it a couple of years ago when they were in their startup phase, um, but I have not, had not had a use for it. But uh, I'm sure I might be able to get extra stuff out of him as well, since I know the founder of it. Interesting. Okay. Well, good. So. One thing you were saying, Joy, and I wonder if, if Joel could think about this a little. Um, earlier, I think today it was, it's all blending together, where you were talking about students wanting you to do more kind of live demos instead of the recorded ones. And I've been finding that a lot as well. Um, this summer, actually, I've transitioned more to like me live coding as opposed to recording my coding and having them watch it because they they seem to like it better because it was happening live for them in class. And I don't know if you've had that happen to you. I I did do one session where um, I, usually they're using some design software and it's not part of my course. It's something they should have learned before. Mm -hmm. But this one particular topic, I knew they they don't get that far into it in the previous course. So I did a live walkthrough of how to use the software to do this particular task that's kind of complicated. And they really appreciated that. And, and I know that they watched it numerous times because of the comments they made later. Um, and so I thought back to myself, I really need to make more of my sessions be just a live walkthrough the, the software Right. Um, rather than just to maybe do some hand calculations on the side that they're going to need while they're doing it, but to really engage them with the software that I know that they want to learn, they want to be proficient in when they go out into the into the engineering world. So that's something I need to do more of is is integrate the, 
me working through the software, designing something, and right there doing the calculations also, that would that would be enriching, I think, for the students. Okay. Yeah, because we I think it was today we were talking about that a little bit, Joy. And uh, yeah. it's been affecting I, me. I kept wondering if maybe they were just missing the, the personal contact, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, I have had people in the past say, oh, well, let's, don't make me watch a video. But, but eventually they, I've always had students say, I really appreciate the videos because you can go through it at, at their own pace. So I, I was thinking maybe um, sort of a, a hybrid of the video approach could work where you put the most basic skills into a video that they can watch. And then when you come, you know, to the in-class portion, then do the, a live walkthrough lesson sort of thing of the more advanced example or, you know, the extension that might be more difficult for them so that they can ask the questions in real time. Whereas the more basic stuff, they can just be like, okay, got it, got it, got it. Right. So it, again, it comes back to what's your best use of the in-class time. So if, if they do want that time to ask the questions, then maybe reserve that for the, the material that really um, begs for the questions, shall we right. say. Right. Yeah, I think that's, I think it the, the, reflects my practice. Along with that is how do we go about making sure that students don't have to watch the videos that they don't need to watch right or, or you know making efficient use of their time yeah we're just throwing more videos at them now that they have to watch and they have to use their time whereas with a textbook maybe you could you know skim through you learned how to skim through and i think there was a presentation about you know how to make it possible to skim through videos um so that you can get the highlights but it's harder to get the highlights in a video than so so I'm asking myself, what am I going to do next semester to test my students at the beginning of the semester? And I'm tempted to give them the final exam at the beginning of the semester and say, look, this is what you need to know. Let's, let's get the gaps filled in, not go linearly through A to Z. That, that kind of reminds me of Katie's presentation where she was talking about like effective formative assessments so that when the student comes in, you give them a couple of questions and based on their answers, you sort them into groups. So the students that are really like, I have no idea what's going on, they do everything, right? But the students that can answer with a decent amount of understanding, they skip some stuff and they go right to. So I wonder if there's, if we can build that into um, our, our pre-work right? So have a way for them to only go to the pre-work that they really need. Right. If you take a look at um, Jonathan Thomas Palmer's talking tomorrow, I posted out his videos about his practice. He goes into details about that, how he sends out the, the sheet to the student. Actually, it's for the whole semester or whatever. And it's like, unit this. It's like, you do this, you do this. This is required. This is optional. And like, it's all really spelled out ahead of time about what they can do, what they don't have to do and then gating them through that you need to pass this unit before you get to the next unit. His, Jonathan's level of detail is amazing. And he talks also about how to give students um, a guide and a, like a worksheet or a kind of a transcript of the video while they're watching the video. So they can like, they have, they're prepared to take notes about the video before they watch the video. I mean, and John just goes nuts with his videos. He scares the crap out of us because his videos are so professional, but, um, I really like the way that he explains the student's point of view of how they're seeing his videos. And he's got so much experience with that. So wow. definitely people who haven't checked out John's work. Um, it's really, really good. I'll try to find that specific video again here in a second. Well, when I was going through um, Kirch's presentation, one of the things that she shows is an organizational chart. And there's different formats, but it just spells out for the whole unit. This is what you have to watch. This is what you have to do. And then I know some of the charts did have like optional activities. So I guess that's that's kind of built in there. But yeah. I think I've always felt like we put the optional activities as extras. If you if you if you're so engaged in my class, you want more rather than at the at the back end of saying this is optional. You don't have to do it. But if you're struggling with this topic this is what you need to do, or this is optionally important for you. 
Right. Yeah, I, I think I've kind of done that when it comes to like when we go into in grade 11 chemistry, when we have our chemical reactions unit, they have to know how to balance chemical equations from grade 10. And so one of the things I tell them at the beginning is if you really have not mastered balancing chemical equations yet, here's some extra practice that you can do. So yeah, I guess it's just maybe more be more intentional about that. Like if you don't know how to add fractions, there's no way that you're going to be able to handle like doing exponential functions involving fractions. So here's some, you know, multiply the numerators, multiply the denominators, it's all good. We right. found that with our right. computer science courses too, because we have that weird situation where you'll get the nerds that have been programming since they're five or six, and they show up to university with 10 years of programming experience, combined with students that have zero and are afraid. Um, and we have to do a lot of this back patching of, okay, some of you can just skip this stuff, but some of you, you're going to need this. And, and we have to do a lot more scaffolding and um, offering different paths for our students in those type of courses. Matthew is, might be having something to share. I really just wanted to thank Joel. I, I watched your video and it was great. I really appreciate oh. you being a part of this. I apologize that I'm not able to sit and be a part of this tonight. Um, I understand. We, we A, have a, a tornado coming through, so yay Midwest, and B, uh, thankfully not directly here, but around. So the internet is all over the place, uh, but it's, it's also family bedtime. So, but I wanted to stop in and thank you so much for being a part of this, uh, bringing your expertise and, and just being a part. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks Matthew, so thanks, much Matthew. for touching in. I appreciate your leadership. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Right. I got to go before it kicks me off. Yeah. Take care, buddy. Okay. Bye-bye. So, yeah, the scaffolding, I think, is um, – I've been thinking about that more as well, Joel, that, because it's also in computer science that I'm preparing stuff for the nerds that need extra stuff to keep busy, but I also have to do the back patching, kind of what, what Joy was saying, of if you don't have what we think you should have had before you got here – we got to, we got to well, get that kind of scaffolding. I think, it, I think you can be a little bit more bold. You don't have to say what we think you should know. You, you, you got to well, have the fractions. to do. Well, that. yeah, it's, it's a little bit. That chemical reaction. Yeah, we need you well, to be able and, to multiply. And for us, a, a big deal for next year is good, a huge thing for us is that we have, I'm in semester at school. So we have students from first semester who completed the course as intended. And then students from second semester who in March had this interruption and were told your mark can't go down from what it was on March 13th and may have checked out and not engaged in the learning for the rest of the course. So they could potentially be going into grade 12 chemistry with a 96 and yet they know very little about grade 11 chemistry because they had a 96 on March 13th and yeah. nothing beyond that point. So right. I think in our case, it's going to be a matter of finding out where those gaps are. But yeah, I don't want to hold back those who did take it in first semester and are off to the races. So I think like more of a mastery style of coaching might be appropriate for the course in uh, the fall. But not everybody's going to be ready to, pr to provide that either. Yeah. Yeah. And even just the students that failed it last, like I've got ones in summer that they only failed it because they did something dumb and, you know, didn't hand stuff in and they didn't get their 70, but they know all the material completely inside out. And I'm trying to keep them busy because, you know, they, they want to learn. So we, we, you got these non-standard in the box students that we have to help along. Well, it really takes us to discussing the fact that that we're try we've been doing cookie cutter education for so long, and the system is still cookie cutter, but now we're in a totally non cookie cutter situation. Mm -hmm. And all right, as teachers, how do we you know, make the best of it and and get really creative about how we engage the students? Yeah, yeah, and so. Um... Besides looking for a new whiteboard tool, um, what's the big changes oh, for August? Yeah. Well, the other big challenge for me is is the talk about is quizzing. Quiz, the quizzing, and there there have been I've looked I've heard some of the tips and tricks, uh, but for the engineering, it just I haven't felt like they're the right kind of 
quiz tools. I'm open to suggestions on that one. So Kahoot is too cute or? Yeah. Okay. There's also, um, oh man, let's see if we can get people's brains going. I'm trying to think of mine. Um, Socrative? Socrative seemed a little bit better when I looked at it. Okay. That's an option. The difference between uh, the Kahoot, a lot of people got frustrated because they can't keep looking at their own device. They have to look at the, the professor's device um, to see the options. Like it doesn't show up on their device. It only shows up on the professor's screen with the A, B, C, D mm. or whatever the colors are. Um, uh. Where Socrative is more supportive of only seeing uh, whatever your view is. Yeah, I'll look for it here a second. I haven't used it for years, but um, I was using it. That's why it took me a little while. Um, it's right there, turn to the website. Um, I will be straight out honest. I haven't used it for about four years, um, but I remember it being a nice tool to so go in you and don't, poke at. You don't, you don't feel, uh, you, you're not doing quizzes when you come into class or? or I'm generally doing quizzes on the fly and just uh, formative assessment without like having them do a, a formal quiz, whereas I'm grilling them. And, and calling out people and, and seeing who calling who has people questions. out by name. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And trying to really, because the point here is trying to dig into what did they get and what did they not get from what they were supposed to read or view the day before. And uh, if silence, then I say, well, I assume you all get it. So let's uh, put our hands to the keyboard and start hacking out some code. Um, but I have found. Um, that these tools are really, really good, Joel. But to be honest, it's just been that my bandwidth has been so low that I haven't been able to prepare as much as I would like to. So I'd yeah. like to use these tools more, but it's a bandwidth issue. Yeah, yeah, that's what I feel lots of times too. Google Forms, yeah, Google Forms work great. Um, even just the built-in quizzes within Canvas that we're using or whatever your LMS platform is usually good. and. And then it, it solves the problem of, um, oh, I have to move the marks from the other tool into my LMS if I want to use the marking mechanism. Um, and even the LMS like Canvas can set up things like John's going to talk about tomorrow where it gates people. You can't jump to this module until you've got 80% on the quiz in the previous module. And you can set it so that they can take the quiz as many times as they want or whatever your formula is but you can set up gating within your LMS so that they can't even go to the next module till they've got their score on that um, assessment for mastery. Yeah, that's cool. You wish people would be honest about taking those kinds of things and not just getting the answers from the Just other hammering people. it out until they get yeah, past it. What uh, is that? Just hammering it out. Oh. I tend to not want to gate my students. I like to lay it all out and have all the option of the entire course out ahead of time but I do know faculty that want to kind of take them push the them hand. through, take them by the hand through the content. So I think it really has a lot to do with your pedagogy yeah. there. Well, and the type of students that you've got in, in your class also, as we were saying about the students that really are asking for the content and those that are there because they have to be there and so you're having to really work on motivation. So the other Matthew from Hawaii is saying, I'm, I've used learning menus to help with that. Well, what do you mean there, Matthew? You want to jump in voice or type away? Hi, yeah. So um, learning menus that I've used in the classroom before, I've even modeled them after uh, menus of a restaurant where the students get to choose their, uh, their appetizer, their entree, and their dessert. And they have to show their learning through those three choices. Um, and so some of those uh, include formative assessments. Uh, some of them include project-based learning. Some of them can be collective efforts where they all kind of choose the same thing together and they can show their learning that way. But there's multiple choices and multiple ways for them to accomplish the same outcome. But Lovely. it gives the student agency and choice, yeah. which makes them have much more ownership and much more driven to actually complete it. Um, the added benefit is, you know, it doesn't seem like uh, homework or a class assignment if you make it into an appetizer, you know, you gotta, in Hawaii, we call them poo-poos. Um, nice. or, or if you're looking at, you know, dessert, you know, this is your, this is your haumea pie that has all the coconut cream in it. This is the top of the tier, you know, it's going to be the hardest, but it's also going to be the most worthwhile. Um, so students often uh, 
engage with that kind of medium and they respond to the challenge of, okay, I have to choose three things and I can choose whatever I want, but I'm going to go for the hardest one on my entry and then just do something fun for my dessert. Um, so it gives them a little bit flexibility and engagement that way. That's great. I love that. And, and learning styles then. That's a way Absolutely. to engage the learning styles. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're jumping all over pretty critical pedagogy and giving the students agency. And I'm totally all about that. But this is Joel's oh, presentation. Cool. I want to talk about connectivism <laughs> classes and all sorts of funky stuff. Or on grading. We won't go there either. I'll get well, so one thing that, that did happen to me this last semester, I mentioned that I had 12 and 12. The, the, uh, the reason why I ended up with two different groups was they chose, the, the university chose 12 of the students to do a project with a company. And so they got cr course credit for doing the project. But of course, the, the, what we were learning in the course was for the project. And so I'm excited to try to write up um, and evaluate these two groups that one had a project with a company and were doing project-oriented learning the entire semester. And of course, right when COVID hit, they had been to the company two weeks and then the rest of it was all online. And so we had Zoom meetings with people from the company. We did, uh, you know, all kinds of group meetings with them trying to make the design for the company. And the other group was doing a traditional but flipped learning as well. So lots of cool things going on with, with having students um, solving problems for this, this uh industrial application of, of what we would normally learn in class in a more theory way. Um, yeah, that's one thing we're doing the Tech de Monterey. We have a lot of courses, especially in our new program, where there's a lot more um, focus on project-oriented learning and working with industries. And I don't, I don't know if other people have much experience in that. If you could share your thoughts on bringing industry into the classrooms and how that helps. Totally going off tangent, but yeah, I, oh, I can speak it, a little bit to that uh, from a personal as uh, experience mm -hmm. as a student. Um, when sure. I was in high school, we had a thing called Business Week, where the entire uh, I think it was uh, the entire high school, all four grades, thousand plus students uh, participated in a invention creation uh, platform where business people would come into the school. And the students would break out into groups and they would just try to invent something. It could be just a prototype or, you know, using cardboard and different materials to prototype something out. But it got them in thinking about, you know, what is the real purpose of what I'm doing in class? How do I actually implement this or think about this in the industry or the, the, the nature of the work that I'm interested in? At the end of the invention process, we had marketing, we had a pitch meeting, we had uh, an open in our gymnasium where all of the prototypes were displayed and then business uh, people from around the community would come in and they would use their investment dollars to basically vote on which inventions they thought each team uh, did the best work on. And that for me, I mean, I was a, I was a sophomore in high school when that happened. And that was around the same time that uh, DNA um, sequencing was just starting to really ramp up. I might be dating myself a little bit there, uh, <laughs> but that for me was a very, very impactful experience and has been with me as an educator ever since. And yeah. providing those types of experiences for students has always been kind of my pinnacle. You know, how do I, how do I reach that level of engagement both in the classroom and bringing outsiders into the classroom to really fully bridge that gap between what education is and what it should be? That's a cool perspective. Yeah. yeah. And how many people, how many of us have taken advantage of Zoom calls to bring that expert from industry into our It's classes? actually making it easier, yes. <laughs> it's so easy now, we can't not be doing it. Yep. Oh, my, my former word. students that are in Silicon Valley and leaders and graduated 20 years ago that can talk to my students now, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, uh, I'm, I know you're doing that, Ken, but I certainly am not doing it yet like I should. I should be doing it many more of that it, it makes it easier for sure so we got a few minutes left any other questions because i think there's also an eight o'clock session so i want to make sure we're not encroaching into um i believe it's crystal isn't it yeah crystal Kirch is coming up at eight 
Um, yeah, and it, since the last one did encroach, we probably want to take a five minute breather to get to the bathroom and get something else. Well, there. yeah, I, I like to make sure I'm on a time. Any, any other thoughts that people wanted to share that I missed in, in the comments in the chat there? Um, uh, why don't you leave your email contact or something there, Joel, in the chat? If yeah, sure. They should be able to find it on the demo as well, but someone might find it useful. I believe I remember yeah. what it is, is off heart. Yeah, I had it right. We're here. And uh, like we said, Joel and I are both at the Tecnologio de Monterrey, which is the large private university in Mexico, 26 campuses across the entire country. So we're also dealing with the, um, the challenges of working nationally with colleagues on standardizing courses and working together on course designs. And that's also kind of interesting discussions, how we work collaboratively with uh, colleagues across multiple campuses and multiple um, configurations of and types of students and types of industry. So we've got some good experience on doing that over the years that we've been involved in the Tech de Monterey. So if anyone wants to talk to about that with us in the future, we've got that bit of experience as well. Navigating the waters of a large campus wide institution is interesting. There's well, Ken, 9, so faculty and 100,000 students. Yeah. Ken, thanks so much for moderating the session here thank for us. I really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you. It gives me an excuse to hang out with you. We haven't been able to hang out much. Yeah. On campus. But come join Ken's coffee uh, on weekdays. He's got a coffee with professors. You can come join anytime if you like. And Hashtag edgy like coffee. You're connected with somebody. Yes. Keeps me yes, sane. Yes, I second that. Edgy coffee is awesome, even though I've only <laughs> been to three. It keeps me sane. I do it. I, I do all of them because I'm the one running them. But yeah, it's it does help. Definitely. So thank you everyone for coming and I will um, hit the stop record button before I start.